If you're like 35 and you haven't checked in with yourself since your 17 year old self decided what major you're going to take in college and then you just went with that and never checked back in, like, would you ever consult a 17 year old right now if you had like a big life crisis? How you spend almost every minute of your day and you write that down for seven days and you look at the way you're spending your time, your jaw will hit the ground, I promise you. Just being in the moment, whatever that is, you have to find 20 minutes a day where the chaos cannot be a part of what's happening. Today's guest is the editor-in-chief and co-owner of Pick the Brain, one of the most trusted self-improvement communities on the web. But get this, Pick the Brain has been named in over 100 best of the web lists. Refinery29 named our guest one of the top 10 women changing the digital landscape for good. Really, there's just just too many accolades, too many breakthroughs to list. So what I will say is her book, How to Get Done, and then the conversation that follows where she breaks down not only for me how to get done, but the story behind she, how she learned all the lessons the hard way that are in this book. You've got to hear this story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Erin Falconer. My, my first thought I had is I love... So like, I love so much your website. I I love so much what you stand for and what you do. You know, I'm, I'm like a white middle-class dude in North America, right? Like I grew up in Canada, but I was, oh, amazing. So here I am outside of Toronto. (laughs) Where are you? (laughs) What part of Canada are you from? You're from Uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg. I I grew up in, uh, and then I went to university in Montreal and then I lived in Toronto for five years. Oh, okay. Well, we won't get too deep into the yeah. okay what, what part of town did you live in what <laughs> what about you what part of town did you live in, in- uh i lit yeah um university yeah. and and lawrence oh yeah okay okay excellent excellent so well so i i, and I grew up in a home uh, i grew up in a home with my mom and my aunt and my sister up until about when i was seven and so uh, my wife is like like takes no from nobody kind of super strong women. And I've realized like, like I love speaking to strong women and I don't know what is it about it, but, but your book and and a lot of the work you do specifically targeting to women, targeted to women. Why do women, especially right now, but all of us, why do we need to hear these messages about how to be able to push through, how to get it done, not to have fear stop us, all of these things. Well, I think now the the climate that we're living in right now more than ever um, is is one of these examples that, you know, if first of all, if you're not living your truth, if you're not living a life that really speaks to who you are, when you get in one of these situations, it is just now on blast that realization you're just stuck in the mud more than ever. And it's harder and harder and harder. It's hard to get through this very fast paced life to begin with, but you throw in, you know, and working from home and all the rules are out the window and people are just completely discombobulated and need a kind of system to guide them. How do I get on the other side of this? And it's truer now than ever that the way you really effectively get on the other side of this is understanding exactly who you are, exactly what you're made of, where you are, how you got here and where you want to go. And that has to be a plan that is completely revolving around you and you alone, not other voices, not the shoulds of life, where you should be, where you, what you should be doing. You need to let go of all of that, no matter where you are, whether you're 20 or 50 or 60, right? And say, you look at a situation like this and say, I actually now really have an opportunity because everything's been thrown up in the air. This is now, I can now make this an opportunity or I can make this a catastrophe, you know, lean into the catastrophe side of this. So um, I think it's really important uh, to start taking stock and doing that critical analysis and that audit of you. But do you think that, like I I was going for a walk with my wife last night, we were talking about the two ways that you just mentioned to see this, right? Like, am I stuck? Am I a victim or have I been given the opportunity to like, to like overturn the table Mm -hmm. and say, you know, like, Hey, you know, like, I think we're allowed to be selfish right now. Like when I think of, 
when I think of all of us, like we're, we have been given permission totally. to say like, I don't want to do those things right now. And everyone's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Be forgiving. Be lo-. like, so why not grab onto this opportunity to um, build what you want to build? Absolutely. I, I said starting, I can't believe it's been like, like six months ago. I thought, I thought we all thought this is going to be done by now. Well, we're coming, we're almost coming up to a year. Oh now, so yeah, this almost is, coming up to a year. So I, I, I said, actually talking to a, to a friend of mine who was, it's kind of led with the question that you led with. And I said, you know, what's interesting here is that once this is all done, or once we start to get into the clear, about 95% of people will go back to business as usual. And 5% will have used this opportunity to completely change their life. And in doing so, change other people's lives, have the ability to change. They will see this as an opportunity and you need to make a decision. Are you going to be in the 95% that is going to become complacent and a victim and kind of just going with the flow, taking no responsibility for your life um, and therefore your success? Or are you going to be a change maker in your own life and see this as an opportunity? There are no rules anymore. You get to write the rules. How do you do that the most effectively is really understanding who you are, what you want, and where you want to go. And only you can answer those questions, right? There's so much fear, though, implicit fear built into that, though. Your people are so scared to sit with themselves, so scared to find out that they might have been on the wrong path for five years or 10 years or however long you've been on, right? But right now you have an almost forced opportunity to do that. If you don't take it, I, I don't know what to say. Yeah, <laughs> this is, it, it's just a perspective. You can look at this as a total catastrophe or you can look at it as an opportunity. But is that- and This is a real so, opportunity. You know, you're much closer to this than I think I, I am, but- have, is there an indicator or a signal or something that you can say, like, what's the difference between the people who will use this as an opportunity? Is it that they're at rock bottom? Is it that they finally had enough? Is it that they've had some kind of excitement or breakthrough? Like, what's the difference between the people who are going to go back and the people who will use it? And can we put more of a finer point on like, hey, this is this is the difference, like between right. these two groups of people? Yeah, well, I always like to say there's like a kind of litmus test that at the end of the day, when you're doing something you really love, you should be tired. You should, you know, you should need to rest. And sleep, <laughs> right. But it's you like spending be, the day outside playing or skiing or hiking. You come home, you're like, oh man, what a day. Like your lungs right. are full and you feel great. Totally. But if at the end of the day, you are exhausted, like it's, are you tired, but full of energy or exhausted with no energy? Because even when you're doing things that you really love, even if you're, you're, you know, as you full on, you're tired, but your energy is there. Mm -hmm. If you're just exhausted, like if you're depleted and you're that you need to look, you're, you are on the wrong course Mm -hmm. and you, and you need to check in with yourself again, only you can answer that. But what starts to happen is, that exhaustion, even if you're not doing that much, right? And you, you get, oh God, I'm exhausted. I just want to go to bed. This is, this, is, this is a big, big, big red flag that something is not aligning for you in the way it needs to, or many things are not aligning for you in the way yeah. it needs to, right? And so um, this is the big thing like, okay, hold on. I need to check something and don't just resign to it. Like, well, this is just where we are. We're just in a pandemic and I've just got so much work and I've got all these zooms and I've got a kid running around it. So I, I should be exhausted. I can tell you right now, no, you can be really tired, but you need to keep that energy level. And if that energy is not there, this is a big red flag to like, you have to check in with yourself and see what's not working and, and what is. Um, so even a step further, if you're find yourself sleeping in a lot or taking naps during the middle of the day or anything like that, that's even worse, maybe. (laughs) Yes. Although I will say that I take a nap every day as a a part of my product. Yeah. I need to, I get people saying it is unbelievable. How are you doing all this stuff? You're running a blog, a podcast, you've got the books, you've got, I'm doing, I'm just about to finish a master's in psychology. I have a three-year-old, blah, 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 blah. And I say, and you're having a nap. You meditate every morning and you take a bath every night. And I say, 
yes, I couldn't do what I do if I don't, if I didn't do those things. So that 30 minute nap buys me three hours of major productivity and energy and focus that if I didn't do that, I, you know, I'd be checked out by three o'clock. It just, I wouldn't have the same capacity that I do now, but that's me knowing me. That doesn't mean everybody has to take a nap. In fact, most people don't, but I just know me that I start to crash in a way that I can't come back from. And so I give up an entire afternoon every day, right? So how did you bump up against, because what you just said, I see as a signal of confidence and strength. Yeah. You earlier spoke about the should ofs. Yeah. And so I think, I, I struggle with this, but so many of us struggle with feeling the should ofs. It's not only that, it's the guilt. It's the like, really? you know, I made the decision only a month and a half ago to say, my fitness is more important than my 9 a.m. stand up gym, you know, my 9 a.m. stand up with my team because right. of the way that things were changing and structure. And I was looking at my calendar, I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to work out for all of these days. And I went, no, 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 no. The team can change because I need my fitness to come first. Because if I don't do my fitness, I don't feel good. If I don't feel good, I don't have productivity. Like, and so, but it's taken me like a lot. And then when I said it out loud to my team, I felt like the most selfish jerk in the world to say that yeah. I'm going to place my health above. But you take a step back and you think about your life. And of course, your health is more important than a 9 a.m. stand-up right. call. Right. How, totally. how, how did you get to the place where you're comfortable enough to say, like to get to the other side of like, no, this is, this is what we have to do in order to make the system work. Right. Well, so, so first of all, that example, is, that's your workout is my nap, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the exact same. And then that you figured out for you what you need to do. You can only do that through an, a personal audit that you keep, you seem to have all of the tools kind of in your toolbox already. So it, it, <laughs> I, I don't practice them though. I, I, I talk a lot. I don't practice them. <laughs> That's why I want to talk about getting done. <laughs> right. Right. So again, it comes down to that personal audit and really understanding what are the non-negotiables for you. And if it means you need a half an hour or 45 or however long your workout is and something else in your day has to shift, then that's what that means. And so you talked about the guilt. So I want to say specifically that is so real. And for women, generally speaking, you can multiply that guilt feeling by about 20. And that's why it's so hard for us to find our voice, to say no, to get rid of the shoulds. And what happened for me, honestly, was I had a total, almost a total breakdown. I was the type A personality born in Canada, you know, valedictorian, went to McGill, went to Oxford, was on a fast track for law school. But I had this little voice inside of me starting when I was in grade 12 that said, um, you know, I don't, it's not literal, but it was like a feeling like be creative, do creative things. And and I didn't know what that meant. It ended up manifesting in me starting to do stand-up comedy at 16. I did that throughout my years at McGill. And this voice kind of kept getting louder. And so on the night uh, before I was supposed to go to law school, Osgood Hall, um, which you might know, uh, I said, I'm going to take a year off and I don't know, do what, but like, write, do some stuff. That ended up being... Uh, that one year ended up being five years. And then I moved down to Los Angeles, much to my parents' abject horror. And they were like, well, what about law school? And not um, only that, isn't LA dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like it was, yeah, not good. But what happened was I moved down here and I was following this voice, but I had no plan around it. And so what happened is, uh, long story short, I ended up in my bathroom in the fetal position, hysterically crying. I had no money. My Canadian, my visa was up. My house was being foreclosed on. And I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. What, what has happened here? What year was this? And, and the scariest thing was not that I didn't have the money and or, or all that stuff. Well, I was broke, and, but that I'd listened to this voice and it, I, I, it had failed me. I thought it had failed me. So I, you know, I had no true north, right? I was like, what am I doing in Los Angeles? Oh my God, I'm going to have to go back to Canada with my tail between my legs. And so luckily I had two mentors that don't know it separately. And I called them 
both crying and saying, I don't know what to do. Oh, my God, like, this is what a disaster. And both of them independently said, well, do you, is that creative side of you? Is that alive? And I said, yes, but what, what difference does that make? There's no, I can't live on that. I can't take that to the bank. I failed spectacularly. And both of them said, well, do you know, you still have, that's what you have. That's the only thing that is true. You, you, there's a lot of unknown variables here, but that's the one thing that's true. I said, what do you mean? Anyways, I got off the phone, totally baffled. And I said, okay, well, uh, I'm gonna, I don't, uh, I, I submitted, a, I said, I'll submit a hundred resumes on Craigslist and see what happens. I did that. I submitted a hundred resumes and I got one response back. And that was to be a copywriter at a, a startup, a self-improvement startup, which this is like 2008 when that's not even like, that's just starting blogging, all these websites are just starting to like really become a thing. So I take this job and I say, okay, I'm going to take this job. It's not enough money. It's $15 an hour, but I'll take this job. And the difference is, is I'm going to put a plan around it. I'm not going to just do this job and try and pay my bills. I'm going to put a plan around it. And that's what I did. And a long story short, I ended up turning that into Pick the Brain, which is my blog. It's, you know, a really, really big, pretty successful blog. Yeah. I have, you, you know, you won't say it. it's, it's, two, massive. it's massive. 200. You can be humble. <laughs> right. So that out of that, I was able to form my other company, Leaf TV, raised a million bucks for that, ended up. So this whole thing, I won't go through the whole resume, but this whole success thing started to happen. And because I was listening to my voice, very important, but also I put a plan in place around it. You can't, it doesn't work just one or the other. You have to be diligent and you have to be you know, strategic about how you're going to interact <laughs> with this newfound person or this person that's in, you know, deep inside with you. Hmm. What happened though, is because I was so you know, PTSD out over my failure, I just put my head down and just went going, 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 just collecting trophies, collecting trophies, like not checking in with actually the path I was taking. If I was happy on that path, it, you know, it was just like, I can't even look up because if I look up, I could lose everything, which is a fear mentality and a terrible way to actually be living your life. Very unhealthy. And so this is a very long-winded answer to your question. Oh, I, I love it though, because now I have follow-up questions. Uh, out of the out of the blue, I got an email from a pretty big New York lit agent, and they said, "Hey, Aaron, we'd love you to write a book." And I and so can you jump on a call? And I was like, "Oh my god, oh my god, this is like this is now all these years later, if I moved to LA, somebody's actually coming to me and saying, "Do you want to?" write something. So I got really excited. I had all these pitch ideas. I got on the call with them that I was like, Hey, da, da, da. so did you have any thoughts on like what you wanted to write me to write? Because I have all these ideas. And they were like, there was a little bit of silence and they were like, well, we want you to write about you. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, well, you know, all the things you've accomplished. And they went through this whole list. And I was like, so gutted. And I was like, what? Like I had all these different ideas of what I thought. And I was like, what? who would read this book? Like, what do you talk? Like, oh my God, what a waste of time. I got off the phone and I was really bummed. I was like, really bummed. I was like, God, oh, you allowed yourself to get excited again. And like, you know, thinking that this could be the path for you and da, 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 da. And I went into the office the next day and I looked around at all the women I was working with and we all almost robotic, like great, unbelievable, creative women, but like just... And I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's me. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm not taking the time to appreciate any of my success, any of what I'm doing. I'm, even though I'm successful, I don't feel like I'm the captain of my own ship anymore. Mm -hmm. What does this all mean? If I can't take the time to enjoy what's happening, yet alone acknowledge what's happening. What is the point? I'm on the wrong course. And I had this epiphany in that moment. And I called the, the, the agent back and I said, you know what, actually, this is what I want to write about. And it is going to be about me, but this is going to be a work in pro progress and process. 
as I discover, rediscover what's important to me and on the things that really matter and where I want to go. And so I really did. I had two kind of awakenings that one where I was lying on my bathroom floor where I was like, get it together. It's this or total failure. And then this other one where I was like, great, now I've got the success. But again, big epiphany, like, but (sighs) wait a second, that I'm doing something wrong. And I was exhausted, by the way, all the time, like constantly exhausted, constantly overscheduled, not thinking, didn't want to be with myself, just like go. And that was a real problem. That was almost as problematic as the first time around, except I just happened to have a lot more money in my bank account, which is helpful, but it is certainly not the be all and end all, right? That's not where you want to go. Yeah. And so how do you, do you proactively check in with yourself now to try and not wait for those moments? And how often do you do that? How do you go about that? Now, now I, now I do. The good thing about this is there's a lot of kind of upfront lifting like right at the beginning when you start a process if you're just like starting from scratch and if you're like let's say 35 and you haven't checked in with yourself since your 17 year old self decided what major you're going to take in college and then you just went with that and never checked back in like would you ever consult a 17 year old right now if you had like a big life crisis like who can i find at 17 because they really know what like living through you're living in the cage or you know what i used to say that my that that it bothered me that the people who worked in my company, I mm-hmm. own a marketing agency, the people who worked in my company, their work was a step on the path of their life. Right. And I used to say it felt like I was shackled to my company. Mm-hmm. This is not a step on right. the path to my life. This is something I've built that I have to build forever and maintain forever. And I made that choice right. when I was 23. And is this what it like? Right. And then, and then, uh, I realized that I, that even though I could articulate that and even mm-hmm. though I kind of complained about it, I never actually did anything about it until right. I was 35 when you mentioned right. it and I had a midlife crisis and I was like, what's going on? I'm desperately unhappy right. Who cares that you built a multi-million dollar company when you don't, yeah. when, when I would come back from Christmas vacation and I'd be driving into work with a like, pit in my stomach going, I don't want to be here today. Oh my like, God. Why it's am I not worst. listening to this? It's the worst. And that's why, and you just said it because you were living the life that a 23 year old you decided was smart. And that was really smart for a 23 year old, but that doesn't mean you're such an, (laughs) we are all such evolved people 12 years after that, you know, at 35, that it's in, if you say it, it's like, it's insane. Why it's, would it's I stupid. Need- no one would do that. And yet nobody would ever. All, we just all agreed somewhere, somewhere, everybody, there's this unspoken truth that it's like, that this is what life in. is. Yeah, exactly. And so, so, so when you're, for the first time, if you're like taking stock and really like, if you haven't done that for, you know, years, a decade, decades, right? It's really scary. And I talk a lot about how to do it in the book, which is, it's not that difficult. It's just, there are steps that you need to go through. Um, I will specifically talk about this idea of a seven day time challenge, which is very similar to like, if you've ever done um, like a food journal or diary, if you're trying to lose weight or getting, you know, you write down every single thing you eat because you really are unaware of a lot of the things you're putting in your body. Well, this is the exact same thing, but it's for how you spend almost every minute of your day. And you write that down for seven days. And when you get to the end of the seven days and you look at the way you're spending your time, if you have clearly mapped out three goals, which I also talk about. You look at the three things you want to accomplish and you look at the way you're spending your time, your jaw will hit the ground. I promise you, right? Because you will notice very quickly that you are spending probably 80% of your time helping other people get their Their goals goals accomplished, right? And that's where the exhaustion comes in as opposed to the tired with energy because (laughs) there's no reward in that really, except for maybe money and maybe, you know, but that's, Again, that's not, you're going to be exhausted. You can be really, really exhausted and have a lot of money, right? And I call so- that the like feeding your soul. Like there are certain things that, sure. you do that just feeds your soul. Right. Uh, and then there are the things that you have to do. And we all have to balance that. Absolutely. How do you structure your time? It, like, do you, do you break it down to that or more areas? And then how do you try to structure your time with everything you got going on? 
three-year-old child, master's right. degree, all of that other yeah. stuff. So I, so, cause I also, am not somebody that sits and does one job for like long, you know, forever and ever. I am constantly having to recheck in because it's like, oh, I've taken on this new project and I have, I have had a learning curve to be like careful. And it's like, okay, well then the old set of what you're doing is not, not necessarily going to apply. So you need to really check in and say, now how much time am I actually spending doing this? And what's the real ask of this? Because, you know, there's the, the, oh, I'm so excited about this. And you kind of have the rose colored color glasses on, but like really how much time is this going to spend, is going to take me? And is it worth it in that case? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so I have one of the things that I've really recognized, which we talked a little bit about is that I do need these breaks. Like I do need like a mental, I need these calm moments Otherwise I can't do it. Some people are not like that. Some people like to go, 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 go and just collapse at night. And that's perfect too. If that's what, you know, it's whatever works for you. I am really of the belief though, that, you know how it's a cliche, but it's also true. And I've heard this many times in real life when somebody comes into the office and they go, Oh, I do, you know, this very, very excited. And they say, listen, I thought about this for this project. Yeah. And da, 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 this is, this is what we have to do. This is the unlock. This is, what we have to do. this is it. And the people sit around, they go, oh my God, that's amazing. Yes. Yes. That's it. How did, how did you think about that? Time and time again, somebody will say I was in the shower yeah. and just, <laughs> I don't know. It just came to me. And so why does that happen? Right? Because that is probably for some, some, most people that is, th those are like the two or five minutes a day when you're sitting there with warm water splashing over you, you're massaging your head or, you know, putting soap on and you're really in the moment and you're not in chaos. What, and what happens? A good and idea comes up. Next, all the dots, it figures it all right. out. It was all there. It synthesizes it for you. So for me, the thing is, you, what is incumbent upon anybody that is serious about getting things done in a meaningful way is you have to find your hot shower, whatever that is, mm, right? That. For me, that's, I, I meditate 20 minutes in the morning. I know that's not for everybody, Right. But you've got to find your hot shower, whether that is going for a walk without, a, without devices and just thinking and taking in nature and just being in the moment, whatever that is, you have to find 20 minutes a day where the chaos cannot be a part of what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And so if, if it's not one of the traditional things like uh, meditating, then you need, it's incumbent upon you to find that because that's where so much of the, of the heavy lifting is gone, right? You're not out there chasing, it comes to you, right? And so for me, I, it was, I, you know, I need to find these pockets where I can really relax and it, they're not long stretches of time, of course, but that was a real game changer for me, not trying to power through. That just absolutely did not work for me. It led to exhaustion, Th then the creativity goes, when the creativity goes, the energy goes, and so, um, it's about, and it's also about trial and trial and error, right? It's not like you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to try this and, and everything. Oh, bam, look at, you know, it's about, okay, that didn't work. That felt good. That didn't feel so good. This could be better. And just figuring out what those, you know, what that specific equation is for you. And also recognizing, I think in the self-improvement world, which I'm very much in, there's this like, uh, it's, it's so misleading because everybody talks about happiness and fulfillment. And I feel like people have this like gold standard of like, they need to feel like they're skipping through a, a field with flowers and sun and birds chirping. And, it, and if it's not that they're failing on this, like perfect happiness standard, that's just absolutely not realistic. I think you mentioned this a little earlier, like there's also what needs to get done in life. So, so I got laser eye surgery, for example, a few years ago, and I, I had such a bad prescription that if, if my glasses fell off of the end side table, I couldn't find them. Like I'd hear them hit the floor and yeah. I'd be like, I'd be oh like feeling God. around because I couldn't read a book without my glasses on. I just couldn't see. Right. So I got laser eye surgery because I wanted to start dirt biking with my son and all of these things. And I just got tired of the glasses and I was sitting there after the surgery was done, getting my hair cut mm -hmm. for the first time. And I realized that I haven't looked at myself in a really long time. Uh, 
And because I go into the bathroom to take a shower, you take your glasses off, right? right. So I get out of the shower, I'm drying myself off, I've got my glasses off. Um, right. I'm getting my hair cut, I've got my glasses off. I never stopped and looked at myself. And I was sitting there, this was three years ago. I was sitting there and I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't look like I was much heavier than I am now. I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now. I don't look good. Um, I don't really like myself. I don't like right. the person who I'm staring at. And I realized it's like, I need to look at myself mm. and I don't like myself mm. and I still don't like myself very much. Um, everyone's advice is like, you know, I feel like I'm a really self-aware person. Everyone's advice is like, no one's going to figure this out for you. You, you gotta dig into it yourself. You it's, it's about self-awareness. It's about spotting red flags. It's about making changes, mm. but we're all walking around hating ourselves mm -hmm. so much. Like how do we, who wants to dig in and help the person that they don't like really, right. or the situation they don't like, or the fact that they grew up in a household that handed them what it had life handed you, what it handed you. Like, like that's the thing that I, that I just wish we could help people overcome more. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. God, that's such a good metaphor though. The literal seeing yourself, because I think that parallels and how profound that is to have that realization of just the literal, right? It wasn't fun. <laughs> I, can tell you. Yeah. I, I can imagine. I can totally imagine, but, but what a poignant moment, right? So again, it's like, it hurts, but it's such a teachable moment if you, if you let it be. Um, but the metaphor, that's why, the exact same thing is true about it's not that people aren't checking in with themselves because they're overscheduled. They are overscheduling so they don't have to check in with themselves because the idea that they would see who they are and have that moment of, I don't even like you. Um, is terrifying, right? And this is all subconscious. Is people aren't consciously thinking this, but subconsciously they are. And that's why, They'll take any excuse in the book to overschedule, to just totally zone out with Netflix, which I'm a huge supporter of, it, as long as you're being intentional about it and not just like a numb as a numbing mechanism, you know, which I think is what people are doing. They're scheduling themselves to the point of like just a total exhaustion and then uh, in front of the TV. And so there's just no possibility of getting close to themselves because they're so terrified of what they might find. The thing is, is that you might not on your on the surface like yourself. The next step is understand is, is the un, of trying to understand why. Once you understand the why, the dislike starts to peel right off, right? And you can start working on really the core of who you are because the things that you don't like about yourself are just layers that have built been built upon a foundation that has been neglected, right? And so it's like anything. It's like a it's like a a nail that's been left in water and hasn't been put back in the toolbox. That's rust. You look at that nail and you go, God, that's a really rusty nail. But all you gotta do is get to the you know what I'm saying? Oh, and I, I love that so I much. Yeah, and it sounds it sounds like cliche in a way, but it's it's the literal truth. Like it's, that's just what it is. And you know, so in the old days you used to have silver out because it was a sign of like right. wealth and stuff. Right. And you'd have to go there and you'd have to polish, you know, we got, my wife and I got given all of this silver and we, right. and we would polish it like every three years. So it looked yeah. like all the time and we'd polish yeah. it. And we'd be like, you can make this garbage thing. Amazing. Like, beautiful. why don't we do this more often? And then we never. Right get around to polishing it. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Cause it's work and it's hard. You, and, and there's also a fear like maybe one time I'm going to go to polish it and I just won't be able to get it off. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. and the longer you don't polish it, the more it's the like, it and the more and work it, it is. And, it gets and the there. more, yeah. that's right. And so that's why that first time, those first sessions of like the first time you look at yourself in, in you know, have the ability to see yourself is so jarring and shocking because you just haven't done it in so long. Right. Mm -hmm. So but um, the exciting things that I've learned is that's when you actually see your greatest gains. Absolutely. Right. Like, like I'm going to just stack metaphor upon metaphor yeah, for us. Good. But, I'm here like, for it. <laughs> but you come into a room, right? Like, like my, my wall here, right? This used yeah. to be, a, I don't know, this is my home office. Um, it used to be some bedroom from the previous owners or something. Yeah. The first, the first brush of yellow I put up on the wall was so 
satisfying yeah. and dark because it's like, you know, think about polishing, right? You're polishing, you take that right. little bit of polish, you go like this, you're like, oh, look at what we've revealed underneath. Yeah. And it's just like, if you could just get to taking that step, you will yeah. see massive gains in a yeah. really short amount of time because you're moving from nothing basically, right? Right. And also let me take this metaphor one step further. <laughs> I love it. So we've been talking about up until this point, um, you know, revealing what's beneath, the true beneath. But you also have the power, once you're being intentional and aware, to choose what you put on, to choose what you add on. And that yellow stroke is exactly that. So you've said, let me take what's here, the foundation, and now I'm going to add something intentional, positive. And so just like the negative things can, can you know, stack up, if you can get to a clean slate, then you have all the power to start putting every positive layer back on, right? And yes. you're in control and it's your choice. And you're not a robot living in the world of should or being programmed by the voices in your head that you grew up with, the people that told you were not, you know, not good enough, or this is what you should do. Those things are all programmed in your head. Once you strip, are able to strip those back, you start putting the yellows, the golds, the silvers, whatever you want, whatever speaks to you. And they're just as effective, if not more so, than the negative things that you've been conditioned to believe. The thing is, you just need to get rid of that, those, before you start building on, right? Um, so, so, yeah, sterling silver and, and yellow paint. <laughs> and yellow paint, silver, <laughs> nails, we did it. We won. We stacked all Rust of them. Rust on nails, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so if I can, I mean, I, I, I would be... Every time I have one of these conversations an hour after, I'm like, oh man, I wish I just circled back on this or dug deeper into this. Like I have an opportunity to speak to this person and I, mm. so I just do, do want to circle back. I mean, this is the, we do hard things podcast. It's about overcoming those hard times in your life and whatnot. So, you know, when you talk about those two milestones in your story, going back to 08 or even, even uh, I guess a few years ago, whenever yeah. it was that you, yeah, that you determined straight. that you determined like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in the life. Um, those are different pictures of you. Those are different versions of you. You've grown right. and you've matured throughout there. Um, were those some of the hardest times in your life? And then, well, let's start there. Were those some of the hardest times in your life or are those just really the ones that make sense for the context of the story arc oh, that, okay. that that's out there. Well, let, let me say the first one was absolutely, I was just absolutely gutted. I, I literally just didn't, I did not know. I was, I was totally spun out. I had, I've always been somebody that's like, even when I made the decision to move to LA and stuff, it was like, yeah, this is it. Let's go. Like I'm an action kind of person. Right. Okay, I don't so as, to... as like this, I'm getting the sense like high achiever, yeah, um, very high you know, achiever. like, like dedicated you, you, I imagine you were the person who had like the pencil case where everything was just like labeled or like perfectly organized or whatnot. Was oh. this the first time that you found yourself going like, I've run out of options. I've run out of things no, to back I don't like like I'm a I built myself I built my whole self-worth on being able to knock things out and there's nothing left right. or what what did you find yourself well, just, in? I'd never failed before and not okay. only did I, I I was somebody that had just succeeded everything I did I did you know I knocked it out of the park and so that's why when I had like chose to kind of listen to that inner voice this thing saying you know do creative things that's why I was so spun out because I was like god I should have been a partner. I could have been a partner in a law firm. If I just not listened to this voice, I'd be running in Toronto. You know what I mean? Like it's some, some, and what I'm in a little guest house crying, not a crier crying on the bathroom floor, like hysterical, like spun out. Like, how did I get here? And I just didn't understand failure. I, I couldn't, I, my brain couldn't compute it. It never happened to me before. And I, this was such a spectacular failure, right? Like I'd moved countries, like I, I'd given up a ton of stuff to do this and nothing worked. And um, so, yeah, I was super spun, super spun out there. And it's a really good thing that I I mean, obviously, in retrospect, it's a really good thing that I doubled down and decided to stay here. But I can't even imagine if I'd gone back and tried to scrape together some law career. I can I can just see 
that that never would have worked. Like that, I had kind of, that was done for me. So if I had kind of tried to go make that a thing again, I don't even know. Like it's scary to me now thinking, it's scarier to me, scarier to me now thinking of that than me lying on the bathroom floor crying. Like, you don't think you would have managed, like, I don't know, I don't want to get too sliding doors, like, mm-hmm. but you don't think you would have managed to, to find yourself being like the most, like everything that you've turned into and built, you would have brought to that other career that you would have done. It wouldn't have tampered you. You would have, you'd be the <laughs> one running the, like the, the, the most remarkable law firm that's built on, you know, this and this and this, no? I'm not sure because I was wounded. I was really okay. wounded and my confidence was really wounded. And the, co- the, co- the currency I traded the most was confidence. That okay. was like, you know, and I was like a wounded a guy. I didn't know who I was without that confidence. Right. Like I really didn't know who I was. And so uh, I was very confused and it was only, you know, luckily, and that's the power of a mentor, by the way, cannot be under, you know, you know, it's very powerful to get people in your life that really are, understand you, understand where you want to go, um, have, have had some success, not from a money perspective, but a living perspective that you respect and that you want to aspire to, because without that, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, look, do I think I would have been homeless living? Absolutely not. That's not, no, I would have figured something out, but I feel like the fire would have substantially gone out in me. And then what's the point? It's, it's interesting because uh, I grew up in a, in a family of builders, like, like construction, building, yeah. developing, you know, yeah. like it's easy for me to build stuff. And so growing yeah. up, I just, I really badly wanted to become an architect, right? Like right. I'm going to become a civil engineer and yeah. I'm become an architect. Right. When I was a kid, I used to draw floor plans and build right. Lego and like, yeah. and even now I like, I just love architecture. But there was this moment in high school where I'm, I'm getting ready to apply for college and I, and I just like fear, basically, I wasn't doing well in chemistry and I needed chemistry and this and that. And I was like, <laughs> film school will be more easy. So I went to film school. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm pretty glad that I went to film school. Film school led to me working here and working there and building my agency and doing this. And, and mm. wow, you know, isn't video a really important skill set or communications or storytelling or whatever right. it is. But part of me still goes like, like, damn, I'd be a really good architect right. if I had gone that corporate-y, right. whatever right. path. Right. right. Any part of you at all just look back and go like, man, I'd be really effective business leader if I had that, that yeah. law degree under me or whatnot. Yeah, I definitely, there are moments where I, I had one the other day uh, where I was like, God, my mind just is so oriented to that way of thinking, to problem solving, to finding the thing that I I was like, God, I would have been, I I, I can't believe this. This was just last week. And I was like, God, I would have been a really good lawyer. (laughs) I would have been a really good lawyer. I don't know if I would have been happy. Who knows? I can't, you know, as you said, can't really play sliding doors and know for sure, but I would have been good at it. I'm I'm pretty confident I would have been good at it. And so I could have been, I guess, happy. But the thing is for me to, have broken. I think if I'd never done the, let me take the time off and do the creative thing. And, and I had just gone to law school and whatever, I think I would have been a very successful lawyer. I don't know whether I would have been, I, true, I don't know what my happiness meter would be, but I am pretty confident I'd be good. I think the, that I took this chance and really tried to pursue something that I thought was integral to who I am and, and it had failed. And then me try and recreate something. I don't, I think that would have been a real mistake for me. So, so if I can ask you this, because I actually wrote in my journal in the fall and, and I remember this cause it jumped out at me, you know, it, I wrote Mark hasn't, Mark didn't fail enough. And it's, you, you just said this. And I was like, you're the only other person I've ever heard articulate it. You know, like I cannot, overstate the fact that like I started off as saying like I'm a white guy mm-hmm. raised in Toronto which is you know a pretty good place to be place. Uh, in a very safe community in a kind of upper middle class family with yeah. entrepreneurs and a supporting mother so like I have this one side of I have a 
totally different side of my story that's not so happy but but i have a one side of my story where it's like i've been i you know i did really well at school i have a very good memory uh sure. you know i like i just i just feel like i haven't everybody talks about like you have to embrace failure mm -hmm. you don't want to embrace failure when when you've built your life on a fixed mindset of like totally. look at how smart i am when everything i crush turns to gold totally and so, yes but what i want to know is you you hit that failure you overcame it. Mm -hmm. We, we, life is just the same thing over and again, same thing over right. and another one of right. these Ray Dalio says another one of these. I've seen this before. Right. How have you been able to progress in business, in growth and all of those things without that, like fear of failure returning Did that moment teach you that failure is actually okay. It's not a big deal. Well, or yeah, well, that was such a big failure that I've had many failures since then. Um, but they, they haven't been of the, the, of the degree or the caliber. And so when you have a failure that big, I was like, you know, when I decided to send out those Craigslist things and take that job, I was like, I will never fail like this again. I will do whatever it takes to put in place so that I am never in this position again. So, but also that was a spectacular failure and it it wasn't that bad in the end, you know, right. like, like, you know what I'm saying? And so the, the, the learning, the teaching that I had about it, if you, it's, it's just a perspective pivot, right? Like failing absolutely sucks and you got to feel it and you got to hurt. And then you have to have the perspective change and say, now, what did I learn? So this never happens again. And if you have that, these are just, you just keep growing and growing and learning and learning. And the failures are often also what I say, unlock, if you let them like the magic of life, like they take you off course and you're kind of forced to like reevaluate and be open to like, if, if you can pivot in the right way mentally, be like, now what else is going to present itself? And for me, that was this weird copywriting job in a, in, in this self-improvement startup, which again was not a thing. And I was like, I'm going to be open to this. I'm going to put a plan around it, but let's just see where this takes me. And that was magical. That mm. was such a catalyst for good luck. And I got very, very lucky with that. And then also, cause I had a plan in place, I was able to capitalize on that. And, mm. and then I have, you know, I failed again, not to that level. And that's why with the second kind of epiphany, I was, I was terrified because I was like, if I stop doing what I'm doing and that has worked from a classic success perspective, what, what are you doing? Like that, that could have, I it was because I'm never going back to where I was on that bathroom floor, but yet I'm challenging how I got here with all this money. So that was a really scary moment. Yeah. And that's where you really have to define what success means for you. And that's, again, it's a personal equation. Is it money in the bank? Is it security? Is it loving what you do and not having that moment where you're driving after Christmas going, Fuck, I just don't want to be here, you know, mm -hmm. is that, you know, to make sure that never happens again, that you feel the opposite of that as much as possible. What, what's your success formula? Is it having a family? Is it, you know, what, so that's an equation you have to create for yourself. And that's not something you use with just your head. You have to really sit in it, ruminate. It takes like days or weeks. And I write about it a lot in how to do that in the book, but um, it, and you can only, honestly, a lot of where, where you want to get is learned through where you don't want to get. And you yes. Oh my goodness. I love that so the much. Failures, right? Like I don't, I'm not exactly sure where I want to go, but I definitely know where I don't want to go. Right. And that's like the first good place. Okay, great. Right. That's information. But is, right? is that, a, is that actually a good thing though? Because, you know, like people talk about target fixation, right? You know, yeah. like, like I ride a motorcycle. That was scary as hell at 35 to learn how to ride a motorcycle on the street. Right. But, you know, they always talk about you put your eyes where you want to go. Don't focus on the thing you're about to crash into because you're going to crash into that. Right. And so we all live our lives, though, with the like, like, I don't quite know how to articulate what I want. But I definitely know what I don't want. Right. Are we focusing on the wrong thing? I definitely know what I don't want. Is just well, is it not just well, target fixation still? No. So you so that's the thing. You know where you don't want to go. Be clear. And then jump off of it. That's where you uh, leave it. That's, that served its purpose. Then, then we right. know where we don't want to go. You can't. And that's that. That's. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a classic move. Then people become fixated. That's again fear based, right? Yeah. So you, you use it as information, 
not, but not as emotional information. It's information. I don't want to go there. Okay, perfect. So we can leave that. Then let's look this way. What is being, where, where am I being called to? Where, what really speaks to me? What gets me excited? What am I? And, and there's nothing that, I think the other thing is that people start with like so many restrictions when they have these conversations. Well, I can't do that. And I can't do that. And I can't do that. Do you, you, to the best of your ability, you have to say, pretend you could do anything. And that doesn't mean that like, if you say, well, I want to be a rock star, you know, and I want to, and you've got no singing voice. Well, we need to be realistic, obviously, but there's information in that. Okay. Wait, you want to sing, you want to perform in front of a live audience. You want to create yeah. music. You want, what is that information saying about me? Now you're not going to be, you know, um, the Rolling Stones. Okay. Especially if you're like, you know, 40 and having this conversation with yourself. But there's a lot of information in that. And so the idea, the driving force is just to have a real curiosity and don't be settled on the first, like the first piece of information, right? Go, okay, got it. No, no, no. No. So what does that mean about me? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You've got to be curious, 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 curious um, about yourself and follow it wherever it's, wherever it goes. Right. Um, yeah. And again, it's, it's like just something that you have to do for yourself. Nobody can, nobody can tell you, but I think people are so like, number one, I can't do 7,000 things. So let me try and slot myself in between those seven things. That's not good. Right. Your window is just so narrow at that point. Yeah. And, and it's just not a, true. You're, you're playing a defense game, right? right. Like, defense. Like you got to play to win as opposed all to about trying offense. to protect you know, like we'll, we'll just win if we can hold on long enough is not, right. is not a very inspiring way to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's not magnetic. Right. And so the more magnetic you are, the more opportunities are pulled to you, the more people are pulled towards you. Then you start to see you have a network of people that want to help you. Exactly. So you want to be as open and as yeah, on the offense, really. Like it's it's your life to go out and take. I love it. But you got to figure out where you're going first, right? It, do you ever do anything? You said earlier, you know, I don't mind Netflix as long as it's with intention. I take naps because it gives me this. Mm -hmm. Do you do anything? Do you purposefully do things without intention? Um. Do you play like, and I don't mean play like let's sit down and play with blocks, but I mean so much creativity comes from the shower moments. Right. Right. But aside from just taking the shower or having the nap or right, going to right. work out or going for the walk, do you do things? Do you, do you do things or tactics without intention? Well, I do. I don't know that this might sound intentional, but for me, my, like besides all of these other things that are street strategic, what really speaks to me is music. So I like just, any chance I can get, I listen to music and that's really unbelievable. I, how it charge. It's like, it's so fun. Yeah. It's so light. It's, I feel energized, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm not trying. It's not strategic. Yeah. You're I'm not saying really like, Oh, like, I'm in this mood. I want to get in yeah. this mood. Let's put on some music instead. It's yeah. just part of the flavor right. of life for you. Totally. And it's, um, it's so crazy how much that can like, like jolt me alive. And I feel like, so yeah. And I feel really creative, inspired. Again, I'm only doing it to listen because I enjoy listening, but there's a lot of kind of, you know, peripheral or whatever you would say, uh, benefits, benefits coming off yeah. of it. And that's why I'm so bummed in this like pandemic because one of my favorite things to do is to go watch music, like concerts, like little performance. And so like, that's, that's you like, you want to know the secret. You want to know the secret that I've done. So here in my office, I've put in surround yeah. sound Yeah, oh, and good. then, and then I purposely go to YouTube or, or I have Apple music, the subscriptions, yeah, yeah. but I go find live albums Oh, that's great. and I just sit on my floor with a book or something, yeah, but I just yeah. sit on the floor right here yeah. and I play the live album from beginning to end, That's even cool. if I don't love all the songs because yeah. it gives me the surrounding of being with people. Yeah. And I love God, it so isn't that, much. Isn't that unbelievable how we don't listen to like albums anymore? But I that, know albums forcing cool. you to listen to an album. <laughs> but that is cool to duplicate that con. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. I've got a little office myself. I'm going to do that. Yeah. 
yeah, just put on like, and, and I was thinking back, I, I thought about this a few months ago. Like when I was in high school, I'd always have a book or, or, or music playing. And I'd just be sitting, like, you'd have that time to just dig yeah. into things. And it's yeah, like, totally. I need to create that environment where it's like, Hey kids, for the next hour, uh, you know, I'm just listening to like, I like Pink Floyd's wall. I'm just listening to the wall yeah. you know, from beginning to end. And, Amazing. you know, just do it. And I, so I love music as well. And I love yeah. music documentaries, oh, like documentaries oh, yeah. on They're, how I, people, I don't know if you've seen Lady Gaga's documentary, but no. it's like uh, five foot two, I think it's called on Netflix. Oh, oh my goodness. I was just like, so good. Oh, I'll I, watch I need, I, I need to be more like Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to watch that. I good rack. Good. Two good racks. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. What question didn't I ask you that I should have asked you? Well, I would say the one thing that is kind of changes your life forever. I have a three-year-old. And so when the child got factored into my whole productivity thing, maybe just how, how that, how I was able to still have my goals and function properly, I guess. Cause the, the you know, the kids you have, you said you have a son, right? Or kids? I have four kids. Yeah. Four kids. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a real game changer, but, I, but I'm the dad. So, right, so I'm, right. I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah. I guess just that, I guess just that and, and more maybe why it's so much more difficult for women than men, even though it is also difficult for men. I don't know. No, it's like we can't, we, I, I, I don't want to dance around the fact it's harder for women. Like, yeah. like I'm a good dad and I'm an active dad. It's harder for women. Like my right. wife, my wife from the age of 23 until 36 put her life on hold. Right. And, and as, and is forcing to discover who she is and, and what she wants. And she feels like she's like everyone else has had 13 years of progress. Right. She feels like, she didn't. And so like, there are, there are some very serious challenges facing uh, moms who are both in the workplace, but also those who have stepped out. And it's, totally. it's really, really Huge. hard. Yeah. I don't exactly have the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I should have asked you, how is it to build this huge empire and be a mom? <laughs> well, no, I did it. You know, I did it because I was, I was strategic and I, I had kids later, a, a, ki a child, I have a child, George. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure how I would have done it. It would have been very difficult if I had done it in the reverse order because um, yeah. it's difficult right now. And I so think Shonda, Shonda Rhimes, I don't know where she was speaking, but I have heard her say um, that, uh, that wherever you see her shining, she is in another area of her life. She's letting someone down. Right. And I found that like there's some keynote speech or something where she just right. digs into this idea of like, you see me running this, this media empire. Well, then I may not be very good here or here or here. I'm doing a really great job here. Right. Now I'm letting my team and my 300 person staff or whatever it is that down, like, it's just, yeah. you, you spoke earlier about the acceptance that life will not always be, you know, there's happiness, mm -hmm. and there's long-term happiness, but there's not unlimited sustained happiness exactly. there's good moments but then there's yep. bad moments there's fulfillment and then that will disappear there's yep. tired sad depressed days and then you know another day will come and you'll feel better that's exactly true but i i think it's i, I don't know if it's the answer but shonda rhymes would say if, if you're succeeding here you have to just embrace the fact that you're probably letting someone else down over here right. and you just have to embrace that and that's the way it is right well that I don't I like know if that's that. the answer because because I still feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and being okay with not being okay sometimes. I loved connecting with Aaron, uh, and I passed along the advice to take a nap to my wife. Okay, three key takeaways for me. Number one: if you want to grow and be happy, you must stop. Check in with yourself, and critically. Look if your current path is taking you to where you want to go. Number two, it's important to schedule time each and every day to lift yourself out of the chaos so you can recharge, you can free up mind space for those amazing, extraordinary ideas. And number three, find an activity that you just want to do just because you enjoy it, just because you want to. It may not even seem strategic, but it will have so many benefits for you and your life. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show ourselves and the world that we have what it takes to make it happen, but you've got to think big. You must be bold. And then you just gotta say yes. If you're ready for another push, 
You have got to hear the conversation I had with this confidence coach. Click on the link right over there. Empathy and kindness. So I have that side of me too. As a woman, when we do compare ourselves to another woman, it's almost as if that woman is taking something away from us.